The New England Journal is a kidney biopsy. It's from a 79-year-old patient who has ischemic cardiomyopathy and some element of chronic kidney disease. He's exposed to a transcatheter aortic valve replacement and subsequently his renal function declines further. Now, in kidney biopsies, there are four, four things basically that we look at. Uh, the filters, the glomeruli. Uh, we look at the tubules, lots of those. Uh, we look at blood vessels, and we look at all the stuff that holds the kidney together. We call that the interstitium. And in this particular biopsy, what concerns us is, first of all, this glomerulus looks rather ischemic and sick. Uh, this blood, blood vessel here is closed. Uh, the tubules actually look pretty good, and the amount of interstitium is not increased very much. Now, in this closed blood vessel, what's remarkable are these open clefts in this blood vessel. And this indicates, this is typical for cholesterol emboli, because the cholesterol material is removed by the fixative, which then leaves these clefts. Now, uh, the other differential diagnoses that are mentioned here are calcium oxalate deposition. We would expect that within the tubules, as shown here. Uh, these are sharply negative birefringent, as shown in this example with polarized light. Uh, now, in patients with acute tubular necrosis, the tubules look sick, and they don't have this luxurious columnar epithelium that we saw actually in this patient's initial biopsy, and the interstitial tissue uh, is increased as shown in this biopsy specimen. Now, cryoglobulinemia was also given in the differential diagnosis, and in cryoglobulinemia, we would expect a lobular glomerulonephritis, where the tough material fills the entire Bowman's capsule, and uh, cryoglobulins, uh, that's shown in this section. Now, renal infarction is caused by the closure of an entire renal vessel. That can also happen with cholesterol embolization. Here's another example. This blood vessel was actually closed, and these open clefts here are left from the fixative, which dissolves the cholesterol. And in this particular example, this patient also developed uh, renal failure over a number of days from cholesterol emboli. Now, there's an editorial in the New England Journal that I wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, in 1973, uh, the Roe versus Wade uh, Supreme Court decision uh, made termination of pregnancy uh, a function of uh, women's decision based on various criteria, not so different than the law that exists, for instance, in Germany. Uh, since that time, there's been an erosion of women's rights to terminate pregnancy, as shown in this map here. The states that are shown in blue or light blue pretty much still comply with the Roe versus Wade Supreme Court decision, whereas all the other states that are red or in dark red have markedly decreased the access that women have to this kind of medical service. Um, that, of course, is against the Roe versus Wade decision. Uh, the authors of this editorial draws attention to the fact that the way that the U.S. Supreme Court is currently set up, that it's well within possibility that Roe versus Wade the decision from 1973 will be rescinded. Uh, abortion rights have been markedly terminated in all the states that are shown in red. For instance, Alabama uh, includes a ban on all abortions, making it similar to Saudi Arabia. And uh, this state of affairs is driven by religious movements in the United States. Uh, the editorialist is uh, very politically correct and doesn't mention the state of affairs, but I draw your attention to it anyway. Now, the paper that I'm going to show in a minute concerns a disease that was first described by this clinician. This is James Brian Herrick. And uh, in the early part of the 20th century, when he was about 50 years old, he wrote two landmark papers, and one of them 
described sickle cell anemia. That's the disease that we're going to look at at a moment. Uh, the other landmark paper that he published in 1912 uh, suggested that myocardial infarction is caused by occlusion of coronary arteries and is not invariably fatal. Uh, that idea had been suggested earlier, but his report was clearly the most definitive. Uh, Herrick was also an advocate of introducing electrocardiography to diagnose the condition already before um, World War I. So the condition that we're going to talk about is sickle cell anemia. Uh, these are patients that are homozygous for hemoglobin S. Uh, heterozygous patients have a relative resistant, resistance to malaria. But if they are homozygous for hemoglobin S, if their hemoglobin is not saturated with oxygen, they tend to form these polymers that's shown here. You'll recall that the problem here is a substitution in the beta chain uh, for a, uh, where a glutamine is exchanged for a valine uh, that en enables these polymer polymers to form when the hemoglobin isn't saturated. We used to do our own peripheral smears when I was a medical student. Uh, the way that we got the cells to sickle was to put the cover slip on and then use a layer of petrolatum and wait for about 20 minutes until the cells became ischemic and then they would all sickle as shown in this peripheral smear here. Now the current treatment actually for sickle cell anemia is uh, the administration of hydroxyurea. This is an alkylating agent that um, uh, interferes with um, ribonucleotide reductase and basically what happens in these very quickly proliferating uh, uh, red cell precursors is that uh, they're influenced by hydroxyurea so that the synthesis of hemoglobin F is increased and hemoglobin F does not polymerize. However, it's oxygen uh, desaturation, uh, hemoglobin oxygen desaturation curve is uh, fine for fetuses, but not very good for adults. So this treatment uh, is suboptimal, although I believe that people that are homozygous for hemoglobin S ought to get hydroxyurea. Now, a voxelator is a new treatment, and this is a small molecule that binds to hemoglobin S and prevents this polymer polymerization from occurring that activity would imply that the hemolysis would be reduced and we would expect the hemoglobin level of patients receiving uh, voxelator to increase and hopefully their vascular occlusive episodes to also decrease. So in this phase three randomized trial, patients recruited from all over the world, all over the planet actually, were randomized to placebo or two different doses of, of, of voxelator, and the primary endpoint was an increase in the hemoglobin level of one gram per deciliter after 24 weeks of treatment. Hope was also rendered that vasoocclusive episodes would decrease, but that was not a primary endpoint. So if we look at these patients, um, a 1500 milligram dose of voxelator, a 900 milligram dose of voxelator or placebo. Uh, about 60% of these patients also got hydroxyurea, and they were from mostly from uh, um, uh, mostly uh, these were black patients from Africa, but there are also patients from other areas uh, ar around the world represented here, uh, but they were for the most part, homozygous for hemoglobin S. And what we see here is that basically hemoglobin levels in the pa uh, patients that got placebo did not change from baseline. There's some spread here, but the uh, mean value is no change in hemoglobin level. The patients that got the two doses of voxelator had an increase in hemoglobin levels, and at the higher dose, the increase was generally more than 
one gram per deciliter. At the lower dose, the increase was about 0.6 uh, grams per deciliter, increase in hemoglobin level. Now, what we see is that uh, there was an absolute change in hemoglobin levels. Uh, indirect bilirubin values tended to decrease. Uh, the number of reticulocytes was uh, influenced accordingly, and uh, the change in the absolute reticulocyte count as well, and lactate dehydrogenase levels also decreased, as did erythropoietin values. Unfortunately, the uh, incidence of vaso-occlusive crisis tended to be less, but that change was not significant. Uh, statistically, maybe that a higher dose of voxelator would be required, or perhaps if a longer period of observation is performed, uh, then the episode of vaso-occlusive crises should decrease. So, uh, and incidentally, the drug was well tolerated. So that there was a, the conclusion that the authors have is that the, the primary outcome was uh, in general met, particularly with the higher dose of voxelator and the markers of hemolysis, indirect bilirubin levels, reticulocyte counts, LEH uh, levels, uh, decreased with the administration of voxelator so that uh, the patients seem to benefit from this treatment. The next paper in the New England Journal, I really wasn't aware of this idea, uh, but um, patients that have a risk for developing Type 2 diabetes mellitus, for the most part, have low levels of vitamin D. And uh, epidemiological data have suggested that perhaps vitamin D supplementation in patients that are at risk for developing type 2 diabetes mellitus might help them. And this hypothesis was tested in this study where large numbers of patients with at risk for the development of type 2 diabetes pre-diabetics, if you will, uh, were randomized to vitamin D or placebo, irrespective of their baseline vitamin D levels. But there was no benefit. And uh, the patients, these patients were observed for 54 months, and the probability of, develop, uh, of remaining diabetes-free was no different in the vitamin D group compared to the placebo group. Uh, there was some trend of improvement, but the spread, uh, the variability in all these various subgroups shown here was such that none of these uh, changes had any significant statistical meaning. Uh, so uh, this hypothesis has apparently been a favorite, and it was also tested in Norway, and it was also tested in Japan. And the Norwegian study and the Japanese study, uh, similar to this American study, uh, these other studies were also negative. Now, this study was powered to detect a 25% lower risk of diabetes. It's possible that there was a modest reduction, less than that amount, uh, but we can't comment further, so this study was negative. The next topic involves a hereditary form of hyperchylomicronemia. And uh, briefly summarized here are five hereditary forms of hyperlipidemia. And this particular hyperchylomicronemia, which is associated with very high triglyceride levels, generally involves a mutation in an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase. So what happens is um, we eat a fatty meal, it's absorbed in the small intestine. The small intestine packages uh, these lipid materials into huge fat globules, chylomicrons are the largest, and chylomicrons are, operate, uh, are enacted upon in the vasculature by lipoprotein lipase. And lipoprotein lipase cleaves these uh, uh, huge fat globules into smaller globules, such as uh, very low density lipoproteins or into LDL molecules that are then taken up by the liver and processed further. If there's a mutation in lipoprotein lipase, uh, then there's a hyperchylomicronemia and triglyceride values 
that's what we measure clinically. We don't measure chylomicrons clinically, uh, but the triglyceride values are markedly increased. And the consequences of that are a marked increase in the, the risk for developing acute pancreatitis. There's also a risk for developing increased atherosclerosis, but the most feared uh, uh, complication is the development of hemorrhagic acute pancreatitis. So here are chylomicrons, here are uh, lipoprotein lipase molecules, and uh, what they do to chew these chylomicrons into smaller pieces, and patients that can't do this have markedly elevated levels in triglycerides and also get these eruptive xanthomas that are shown here. And if we look at their serum, their serum is milky. And if we run it down an agarose gel, we can make a more definitive diagnosis. So acute pancreatitis is the most feared complication. Another variable in the story is the presence of apolipoprotein C3. Uh, which plays a role in whether or not lipoprotein lipase is effective in cleaving uh, these um, uh, chylomicrons. And if uh, uh, APO um, C3 is uh, low, then lipoprotein lipase seems to be more effective. This would imply that APO C3 inhibits lipoprotein lipase. The story isn't quite that simple, but we'll leave it at that. So one strategy to fix this problem might be to suppress apolipoprotein C3. And that was the hypothesis that was tested here. So an antisense oligonucleotide gene therapy, if you like, volanosaurin, was utilized in these patients to suppress apoc 3 in the hope that that would lower triglyceride levels in these patients and decrease their risk of developing acute pancreatitis. So finding these patients, they're not very common, but at any rate, 66 patients with uh, LPL mutations or some other mutations that cause a similar syndrome uh, were recruited for this study, and half of them got placebo and the other half got volanosaurin with the idea that we'll suppress APOC3 and thereby lower their triglyceride levels because the little bit of LPL that they still have would be more effective. And indeed, this antisense oligonucleotide lowered APOC3 levels by 84% at three months. Now this material has to be injected subcutaneously. And indeed, that reduction in APOC3 was also associated with a decrease in triglyceride levels of 77%. Looks like a good deal. And we can see that graphically here. Uh, this is APOC3 reduction with, with volanosaurin drops more than 80%. Triglyceride levels also fall by about 70%. And if the patients uh, continue on the treatment, uh, then their triglyceride levels stay low. Uh, if they de uh, decrease, if they can't tolerate the treatment, um, then their triglyceride levels increase accordingly. And if we look at the percent decrease of triglyceride, we see that it's 77%. And if we express that in milligrams per deciliter, these patients had very high triglyceride levels. Uh, the triglyceride levels dropped by 1,000 712 milligrams per deciliter in this group, and they didn't drop in the placebo group at all. There are problems with this material and uh, painful uh, reactions at the injection sites. Perhaps we could live with those, but a substantial number of patients had a decrease in platelet counts. And some of the patients had, not very many, but some patients had a decrease in platelet counts so that their platelet count was less than 25,000, which caused the investigators then to discontinue the drug. And the reason for this decrease in platelets is not really clear. Uh, the investigators thought it might be an immune reaction, but methylprednisolone and immune globulins didn't seem to be that successful in terms of avoiding this complication. Now, vascular events were not reduced in this study, but we wouldn't expect that. Uh, we would expect that this reduction in triglyceride levels might protect the patients
from acute pancreatitis, larger studies would be necessary to test that notion. But since acute pancreatitis is common in these patients, uh, this might be a reasonable treatment to try to avoid that complication. I'm now going to turn to the British Medical Journal. And this is a follow-up on the Whitehall cohort. Whitehall is a street in London, and it goes right through the governmental neighborhoods. And uh, Whitehall, the Whitehall cohort, are basically uh, a bunch of governmental employees in Britain that have been recruited for epidemiological studies ongoing since World War II. So this is a large collection of British bureaucrats that have been observed by epidemiological investigators. And the hypothesis here was uh, the rate of cognitive decline in people past the age of 50. And that's been mapped out very well in this Whitehall cohort. And the question that was asked here is, um, do medical or surgical illnesses have an influence on this rate of cognitive decline in these older patients, particularly surgical procedures. You might think that open heart surgery or getting your hip replaced if you're 75 years old might increase your rate of cognitive decline. So here we look at the patients and there are quite a few patients. Uh, we're talking about 5,000 admissions in this large cohort of people that participate in this Whitehall study and they, they get tests of their cognitive abilities over time. So here are the surgical admissions. Uh, the age of the patients is a, a over 50, although there are also some younger patients, and the medical and the surgical admissions were similar in age that's shown here, and the follow-up period of time is given here, and it was also some lived past 20 years after these episodes of possible risk for cognitive decline, uh, but many did not. So the patients are about 55 years of age and uh, diabetes, and smoking and hypertension and all of these problems, or as we might expect in this large collection of British bureaucrats. And here's uh, their cognitive decline. So uh, the blue line here is if nothing happens. So this is the normal cognitive decline if you're a British bureaucrat. So you're better, you're cleverer at 60 than you are at 75. Now here are the patients with the medical problems and pneumonia and heart attack and all these various things I guess are tolerable. But if you have a stroke, uh, your cognitive decline is the same as if you'd suddenly age 10 years, that's bad. But the surgical people really did pretty well, and their degree of cognitive decline is an increase of about five months compared to 10 years in the poor patients that have a stroke. So it looks like major surgical procedures, bypass surgery, hip replacement, chest surgery, all of these sorts of things, place patients at risk of aging of about five months, which I think is acceptable. Uh, medical problems actually are a greater risk and stroke is of obviously we would expect that is the greatest risk. Now the review in the New England Journal is, uh, I usually don't show authors, but I couldn't help but show Hartmut Neumann, who's the first author on this review. And Hartmut Neumann has dedicated his entire career working up patients with pheochromocytoma, and he's done a marvelous job at it. And he had a review in the New England Journal on this topic, also original papers on this topic in the New England Journal over the years. And Hartmut points out that the first description of pheochromocytoma was by a pathologist in the city of Freiburg uh, sometime in the last century. And he described a woman, 18 years of age, who died after panic attacks, tachycardia, and sweating, and she had bilateral adrenal tumors. From that description, we could already bet that she has uh, some sort of genetic reason to have bilateral adrenal tumors. And so Chatelius described pheochromocytoma, and Hartmut Neumann, 100 years later, uh, uh, analyzed what was left of this patient and showed that she had MEN type 2, 
uh, that we discussed last week. Now, the biochemical diagnoses with metanephrines and normetanephrines have a sensitivity and specificity of over 95%. So we now have wonderful biochemical tests to show the presence of pheochromocytoma, which also has decreased dramatic, increased dramatically in the last 20 years is imaging to find these damn things. I could remember when I was a medical student that we would catheterize blood vessels in patients and squirt them with glucagon to activate the pheochromocytomas to try to find out where they were because we didn't have all this wonderful imaging that can now be used to find where these pheochromocytomas are. Lots of them concern germline mutations, which also has a major influence on their clinical presentations and whether or not a we're looking for pheochromocytomas in the adrenal gland that produce epinephrine and norepinephrine, or if we're looking at paragangliomas that produce only norepinephrine, and whether or not they're going to be present in the head and neck, or in the pericardial sac, or in the abdomen and adrenal gland, et cetera. And here are a series of germline mutations, number of different genes that are involved here, number of different syndromes. These are invariably autosomal dominant, and about 40% of patients with pheochromocytomas, at least in Europe, have some sort of genetic cause, germline mutation, uh, to, um, uh, that obviously has, a, since they're all autosomal dominant, has a major impact also on their family members, whether or not they're the, at risk from these syndromes. Hotmode doesn't discuss this, but even in the patients that have a non-germline pheochromocytomas, if you examine the tumors carefully, they invariably have some sort of a somatic mutation, many of them in these genes that are also involved in germline mutations. So the imaging has increased remarkably, and that means that more conservative approach can be utilized to find these things and to remove them. And even in the patients that have malignant pheochromocytomas, von Hippel-Lindau mutations, et cetera, can be approached with a more conservative surgical treatment of their problems uh, so that they have a tolerable prognosis. So this is a very important review and I would encourage you to look at it. Just as a brief note, transverse plane, sagittal plane cuts the people in half right to left, coronal plane cuts them in half from front to back. And here's an example of a coronal plane MRI in this patient where we can uh, see um, this huge spleen here reaching down into the pelvis. Here's the liver. Actually, I think that I'm still confused. Maybe this is a transverse plane because I can't see the pelvis. I should be able to see it. Can't quite figure this plane out, but at any rate, this is a huge spleen, and this is not a case of uh, visceral leishmaniasis. This is a patient with a T-cell leukemia. I was curious whether or not this patient also had a, a T-cell leukemia virus that we discussed several weeks ago, uh, but that wasn't reported. Then uh, we return to this patient that was described in the New England Journal several weeks ago. This is the woman with the cyclic vomiting syndrome. Every time her urinary, uh, her urine is examined, examined, it's positive for oxycodone, um, methamphetamines, uh, cocaine, various other things, and she has episodic, an episodic presentation. She then develops the supraventricular tachycardia uh, that reverts with intravenous adenosine. Uh, her physical examination is the, is she's said to have an intense gaze. No other eye signs are given. She has a fine tremor. Uh, she didn't cooperate during a neck examination, although I would think that inspection would be adequate for this particular patient. And uh, a complete neurological examination wasn't given. And so we were supposed to speculate on what she might have. Uh, this imaging was done here, and she's got some small renal calculi, 
but basically, and a fatty liver, uh, but basically nothing else was shown. And we were polled as to what she had. And I suggested that she might have the serotonin syndrome. And most colleagues taking this test uh, agreed with me. Turns out this patient had hyperthyroidism, which irritated me a little bit. The discussant here quickly reviews supraventricular tachycardia, stone disease, substance abuse, and the serotonin syndrome. He points out the fact that uh, uh, the serotonin syndrome is characterized by clonus, but I couldn't tell that this patient was ever tested for clonus. And um, so the patient ended up having hyperthyroidism. And um, if we look at her laboratory values, uh, I missed it, uh, but uh, TSH, which is routinely measured in people that have supraventricular tachycardias, uh, wasn't reported. So I think we were probably sandbagged on this patient report. Uh, so this patient had hyperthyroidism. She didn't allow her neck to be examined. But I don't think, I think inspection would have been enough here. And if we offer these patients a glass of water and just look at them carefully, we should be able to make this diagnosis. So she has Graves' disease, uh, which is uh, basically an autoimmune phenomenon involving the long acting thyroid stimulator. Uh, th this is, um, <laughs> these are, thyrotropin receptor antibodies, now called thyroid stimulating immuno immunoglobulins that are responsible for Graves' disease. Then we see some additional, apparently a little, a little later, the patient was cooperative. And this is an ultrasound of her neck. And um, this tremendous vascular activity here uh, is, um, called the inferno sign. And I'm quite certain that if the investigator had just placed his stethoscope over this patient's thyroid gland, he would have been able to hear this inferno sign, but apparently that wasn't done. So this is pretty interesting. This patient received several large doses of iodine from the imaging studies. And in patients that have Graves disease, uh, this dose of iodine toughens the thyroid gland, which is, that's the term that we used to use in the old days. And less thyroid hormone is then dumped out. This is called the wolf chaikoff effect. Now in patients with nodular goiter that receive iodine, they can have a converse reaction where they suddenly, re suddenly release thyroid hormone and get hyperthyroidism. Uh, that's called uh, in Germany. So that's all discussed here. Pretty interesting, and I think you should look at it. Incidentally, the criteria for this serotonin syndrome uh, have been expanded uh, due to the Hunter Area Toxicology Service, which is a large group of toxicologists that cooperate in Australia. And they've gathered a large number of these patients and have expanded on the Sternbach criteria, which in, involve um, these clinical features shown here, including myoclonus. And in order to find myoclonus, you merely need to perform dorsiflexion of the ankle joint, and you should be able to find the presence of myoclonus. And all the drugs that are associated with the serotonin syndrome, I have re reviewed for you here. And uh, here, given in German, are all the symptoms that these patients develop. Uh, these are called the Hunter criteria, and uh, they're outlined in, in this table here. Here they are. And uh, basically, clonus, either spontaneous or inducible, seems to be the most prominent physical findings that these patients uh, with serotonin syndrome exhibit. Now, this is a patient from last week that has air in the spleen, and she indeed had a peptic ulcer, underwent exploratory laparotomy, and um, had this ulcer and had her spleen removed and the ulcer repaired. I wish they would have shown, shown this ulcer. They didn't, but here's the picture of it. 
Now we move to the Lancet. And the first issue is malignant melanoma that's operable. So these are patients that have a cutaneous malignant melanoma that I, they didn't show these melanomas in the paper, but I assume they look like this. And the, these melanomas are then surgically excised. And the question here is a margin of two centimeters versus four centimeters. Does that have a difference in outcome? Because a four centimeter margin is a fairly large chunk of tissue that has to be removed here. And uh, that brings about a variety of clinical problems that perhaps surgeons would like to avoid. So this is a, com a randomized comparison of two centimeters versus four centimeters surgical excisions of these malignant melanomas. So here are the patients and their age and uh, where the tumors were and the tumor thickness. This is all graded very carefully by physicians that deal with this particular clinical problem and uh, how the procedure was done, I've out outlined here, and how the patients were followed up is also shown. And what we see here is that there's no significant difference between a four centimeter margin compared to a two centimeter margin, so that a two centimeter margin, less morbidity, might be acceptable in the surgical excision of these malignant melanoma. Malignant melanomas, there's an 8.8 Follow, years of follow-ups uh, in this particular study uh, supporting that point of view. The next topic in the Lancet are giant cell tumors of bone. And uh, these tumors are surgically excised. Uh, we now have excellent imaging study, studies that we can do to diagnose these tumors, providing the surgeon with an idea of what has to be done. And uh, here are the giant cells, and you can admire them here in this particular a photomicrograph. Now, these tumors are treat, treated operatively and subsequently, if necessary, with radiation therapy. But it's also known that these tumors have to express a receptor, uh, the, the CSF1 receptor, which is the receptor for macrophage colony stimulating factor. And macrophage colony stimulating factor, as I show, shown here, through MAP kinase activation, is a proliferation signal that might have an influence on how these tumors behave if they overexpress this particular receptor. And we now have a receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor of this particular receptor tyrosine kinase, and that drug is called pexidartinib. So these patients with these rare giant cell tumors, after their excision, were randomized to pexidartinib versus placebo and followed up for a long period of time, 25 weeks at least. So here we see the patients and they were randomized to pexidartinib compared to placebo. Then imaging studies were done at periodic intervals to see if also a chemotherapy could be applied for these giant cell, their sarcomas actually, their giant cell tumors. Uh, which otherwise have no chemotherapeutic treatment. So here's the, these are waterfall plots, and here the, here's the placebo group, and there's no change here. Some of them got worse, and some of them, few of them got better just by chance. But the patients that got pexidartinib changed from baseline. These patients, with one single exception, all got some better, and some of them got dramatically better. And their volume score and their... Uh, Patients that uh, said, hey, I don't want to be in the placebo group. I'd rather be in the pexidartinib group. I've heard rumors that it was better. They also responded. So it looks like pexidartinib, this tyrosine kinase receptor inhibitor, helps these patients with these giant cell tumors. Their pain scores got better. Their functional scores were better. Their uh, range of motion was improved. So it looks like we have a chemotherapeutic approach to this not very common, giant cell tumor of bone that helps these patients. The next topic in the, in, in the Lancet involves a, patient, a, a protein called Dickhoff. Dickhoff is the German word for fathead. With a name like this, you can imagine that this gene was discovered in Drosophila because Drosophila geneticists have, a lot of them are German, uh, so these Drosophila geneticists have a pretty good sense of humor. So this, tumor, this gene was named fathead. Now, 
What we're talking about today is fathead three. And these fathead proteins that are involved in development, particularly also bony development, interfere with a signaling pathway called WINT. And WINT and beta catenin target genes uh, are involved in proliferation and uh, a whole bunch of functions that I'm not going to dwell on here. But DICOP3 has been in, identified, there's a Jason paper on, about this uh, from 2018. DICOP3 is a stress induced tubule derived protein that induces fibrosis by acting on Wnt beta catenin signals. That's interesting. So keep that in mind uh, because this study, which is also from Germany, involves DICOF3 as a possible marker for injury. People that are at risk for the development of acute renal failure. And the remarkable thing about this marker is it's already elevated before these patients are subjected to their risk of developing an acute renal failure which in this case was open heart surgery. So we already have biomarkers, if I can call them that, that go up after injury has occurred, but to have a biomarker that's already elevated before injury occurs, of course, would provide a substantial possible advantage. So in this particular study, all these patients that were undergoing open heart surgery had DICOP3 measured before they uh, underwent open heart surgery. Then they were observed whether or not they developed acute renal injury, acute kidney injury. Their GFR levels were measured at discharge, and then they were followed up. Several years later, their GFR measures, uh, measurements were repeated to see if they were at the, any risk for developing chronic renal failure. And basically what was found here is uh, DICOF3 levels in urine were compared to milligrams of creatinine in urine to adjust for whether or not the urine was concentrated or dilute. And what the investigators found was that patients that had a, a, a value greater than 471 picograms per milligram creatinine were at risk for developing acute kidney injury and for having an elevated creatinine at the end, or end of the observation period. In other words, developing chronic renal failure. So that's shown here. Now, I know that this is a little difficult to read probably, but so this is the DICOF3 to creatinine concentration. And as we see that in this particular diagram, the greater that concentration is, the greater the risk of developing an acute kidney injury. So that if we look at the sensitivity of these, this test, a right angle would be 100% sensitive. Well, it's not 100% sensitive, but it's not bad to have this particular relationship here, particularly in the people, to identify the people that have a severe loss in glomerular filtration rate that's shown here. And um, so the people that had an elevated and this is before the operation was done, that have an elevated level, have a substantially increased chance of developing acute kidney injury and of having a higher creatinine level at the end of the period of observation, which was several years. Now, if the investigators then were confronted with a finding a confirmatory cohort, so they had to look around in Germany to see who else was looking at patients undergoing open heart surgery. And they found a confirmatory cohort. This confirmatory cohort's a little, confusion, a little confusing because these patients were also randomized to ischemia preconditioning, reperfusion ischemia preconditioning. I'm not going to go into how that's done. Uh, we've done that on earlier occasions. But here again, the patients that had a, a value of DICOP3 compared to creatinine of greater than 471 had a substantially increased risk of developing acute kidney injury and of de developing long-term elevations in plasma creatinine. That's shown here. So the confirmatory cohort seems to 
confirmed the author's contention that DICOP3 levels before the risk for acute renal failure occurs is a worthwhile marker. And the patients that had the ischemia reperfusion reconditioning seemed to do a little better, but the trend is the same. So this is a preoperative urinary marker for acute kidney injury, and that's fairly interesting. The next paper in The Lancet involves uh, how good is this vaccine against papillomavirus? And uh, we now have a vaccine against papillomavirus that might protect women from cervical cancer, but it might protect both genders from developing venereal warts, and it might protect both genders from developing cancer of the tonsil and this nasopharyngeal tumor that's common in the far, in the far east. And uh, so this is a, an evaluation of 80,000 people that have now been vaccinated for papillomavirus. And what we see here is that uh, young people seem to benefit if the vaccine is given to older persons. The benefit is not that great. We wouldn't expect it to be, be because uh, these patients have already probably outlived their risk. So the current strategy of giving, offering this vaccine to young girls and uh, young men seems reasonable and uh, favors vaccination, I think is pretty convincing. It's more difficult to show that in older individuals. But if we look at the relative risk of uh, developing these awful genital warts, uh, we can see that the influence uh, in countries with a multi-cohort vaccination that's at a high level do better than the ones that don't vaccinate as much. And young people observed over longer periods seem to show a more prominent benefit than older individuals. So I think uh, that we can, we can conclude that this vaccine works and that the people ought to get it. And this is a follow-up on 60 million individuals up to eight years post-vaccination. Now the reviews on in the Lancet are on genomic medicine, and there are three of them. Uh, I have nothing against gene tests and have been known to perform some myself. I'm very pleased that the authors didn't call this precision medicine because it's only precise if proved to be so. And so this is about genomic medicine. And what, uh, what's done here is uh, uh, DNA and RNA sequencing, looking at single nucleotide variants or structural variants that might provide some risk. And what's discussed here are deletions, insertions, frame shift mutations, expansions and single nucleotide polymorphisms and uh, the various things that could be found. Uh, cystic fibrosis is, an, is a Mendelian disease. Obviously that needs to be done. Phenylketonuria, et cetera, muscular dystrophy panels. Those are all great ideas and I'm in favor of them. Um, and uh, that's reviewed in this first review. Uh, the second review on genomic medicine concerns pharmacogenomics. And it's true that uh, people's reactions to drugs, drug metabolism through the CYP, uh, CYP P450 enzymes is strongly influenced by genetic variants. Whether or not this has any clinical utility remains to be seen. There are some very important mutations here that are well known. Uh, one for warfarin, for instance. And this has been looked at in several prospective randomized trials, whether or not telling the clinician what the mutations are uh, results in better care than clinicians that uh, merely follow the uh, clinical practice of administering warfarin. And knowing the mutations has not shown to been, be of any benefit, to my knowledge, in several prospective randomized trials. But uh, the authors have a different opinion, and that's discussed here. And then genomic medicine for undiagnosed disease. And since we can sequence the entire genome now for $1,000 or so, uh, this would have utility. And I think that's convincing. Uh, it's helpful if you have some relatives, so that if you can construct mother, father, child, or a small family tree, that certainly helps. And uh, Data sharing, I suppose, is a good idea, and whether or not uh, 
total genome sequencing or exome sequencing should be done, family members, all a good idea. And examples of where this is successful is shown here. So I have no problem with any of that. Then this patient in the Lancet, dyspnea and clubbing in this patient with cirrhosis. And if we look at his hands, first of all, his fingertips are blue and he's got clubbing. So what the investigators did here is they took a syringe of saline, shook it so that it makes these bubbles, squirted this intravenously, and we see the bubbles in the right atrium and the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. And we also see the bubbles in the left ventricle and in the left atrium where, where they shouldn't be. So this patient has a shunt, and that explains why he's hypoxemic, particularly while lying down, and the hypoxemia gets better when he's sitting up. This phenomenon is known as orthodeoxia. So this patient exhibits orthodeoxia, and he's got chronic liver disease. And patients with chronic liver disease, we can apply the alveolar gas equation. I'm not going to go through it for you here, but he's got a gradient, particularly while lying down, a gradient between alveoli and arteries that's uh, greater than 15 millimeters of mercury, it shouldn't be greater than 10 at his age. So he has orthodeoxia. And we've discussed this problem. And patients that we saw in our clinic, we had this one poor woman with Rendu osler weber's syndrome that had pulmonary shunts, and she shunted more lying down than while sitting up. But it's generally seen in patients with cirrhosis, and it's called hepatopulmonary syndrome. That's it for this week. I'm probably going to have to do this exercise next Tuesday instead of Wednesday because I have, a, I have an appointment on Wednesday that I can't shake on the 21st. Uh, but I'll let you know by email exactly when it'll be. And thank you very much for listening. Too fast?